Thank you, Dr. Minu, for um, inviting me to come and for giving us a few moments to share a little of what the Lord has uh, placed on my heart. Um, I was so glad that this weekend I've gotten to speak over the two things that probably are the most important in my life. Um, one is the call to missions and the call that God calls in each one of us to uh, be part of the message or the, the plan that God has to reach the nations for the gospel. And, uh, and so I got to share some about that yesterday. And this morning, um, I was thinking and praying about what is the second thing that God has really put on my heart, and really it's this, this ministry of adoption and, uh, and, and what the Lord has, Lord has taught us during that process. And so I want to share a little bit about our own story and what the Lord teaches us about adoption into his family uh, when each one of us became children of God. Um, so I want to begin with by saying that adoption is really at the heart of the gospel, and that's what I hope to illustrate to you is that Adoption has always been God's way of bringing us into his kingdom, right? That he allowed for us to be able to be people that had no family, yet because of the price that his son paid for us on the cross, he allowed for us to be able to have relationship with him and become part of his family. Um, let me just show you a little bit about my family. Um, this is some of my children. There's nine of them in that picture over there. My daughter was in college, so I couldn't get her in that picture, so I put her on the side. I didn't want her to feel excluded. So um, I have... Ten kiddos, uh, five boys and five girls. Um, our oldest three, the Lord blessed us through uh, our, our biological children. That's uh, Karna, who's in college, and then uh, Vivek, I think is back there. Yep, Vivek is 15, who uh, drove me up from Dallas to here, uh, which was uh, somewhat nerve-wracking, but uh, he did great, and so I'm glad that I'm alive here this morning. <laughs> and, uh, and then I've got my son, Luke. Uh, Luke is my second, uh, my first son. And then after that, uh, Mike is there. And then I've got my daughter, Myra, who's in the middle back there. And then there's Caleb and Emilio. There's Priyanka. There's Gabriella and Nora. So that's my family. So lots of children. And so many times when I go to speak, you know, I get the easy job. My wife has the hard job of taking care of the other eight at home. So you can be in prayer for her because her job is far more difficult than mine. Uh, I only have to get two of the boys with me, and she's got the other eight. So, uh, so be in prayer for my wife, Melissa, who is at home with the kids. I want to begin with two passages that I think will be helpful for you. And the first passage is from Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. It says this, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you no longer are a slave, but a son, and if a son than an heir through God. In Romans 8, chapter 8, verses 14 to 17, it says this, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as son, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may be glorified with him. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we just pray that, uh, Lord, that, that the message of the gospel would become so clear. Lord, we're so thankful that you didn't leave us in our broken state, but instead you sent your son to die on the cross on our behalf so that we would have the right to call you father. Lord, we had no family, no place to call home, but because of your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, you adopted us into your family and not just as a slave, but Lord, you gave us the privilege to become sons, sons of the living God. And not only that, Lord, you gave us the privilege of becoming heirs. And I pray that as we see the gospel lived out in our lives, Lord, that maybe you be convicted of how we can share the love of Christ to those around us and point them back to Jesus. Let me pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I want to begin with a story, and the story is the story of my children. Um, these are our initial eight. This is about a year after we adopted our kids. We have had our kids now for seven years, so it's been quite a bit of time since we adopted them. And I want to begin with a story, and it's a story about my children. At the age of five, a little girl in a town in South Texas was left in charge of her three siblings, aged three, two, and one. Her parents left her in charge of caring for her siblings while they were intoxicated. She thought they would come back after a few hours, but those hours turned into a whole day. Her brothers only had rancid milk left in their bottles, and their diapers had not been changed all day. 
all of them were hungry and dirty, and because she didn't know what else to do, she left her younger brothers in their apartment while she went outside searching for food. After a while, she found a woman who she begged for food because she was so hungry and wanted some extra to take for her brothers. This woman became concerned and followed the little girl to her home where she found three little boys who were unkempt and hungry, and she called the police. This began their journey with Child Protective Services, or CPS. CPS finally found the parents and worked with them for months to see if the parents could turn their life around to take care of their kids, but despite much assistance, their addiction to drugs and alcohol was too much. A few months later, the four kids were taken into foster care. They spent multiple days sleeping in a cot in a CPS office, office because there were not enough open beds among foster families to accommodate all of them. It's hard to find a foster home that can take care of four kids at once, and soon the hard decision was made to tear the kids apart from one another. The oldest two were placed in one foster home, and the younger two were placed in another foster home. The one thing that the kids had remaining, their relationship to each other, was also taken away. The kids bounced around from home to home in foster care. The trauma of being taken away from her siblings was too much. Rather than coming to terms with the grief, the little girl acted out in anger. Her fits of rage were so much to handle that she got moved from home to home and she was placed on ever-escalating doses of antipsychotics to tranquilize her. She was living in her seventh foster home when God called us to bring her and her other siblings home to my family. That little girl is my daughter. Her name is Myra. And that was the story of how the Lord brought them to our family. I want to begin by saying that adoption is at the heart of the gospel. God didn't need us, but yet because of his infinite mercy and grace, he chose us to be part of his family. And not just part of his family, but he chose us to be his sons, to bear his name and to be his heirs. My son Micah is here and he has my last name. He's a Philip because he's my son. Just like I am a son of God and I bear the name of Christ because we were adopted into his family. To bear his name and to be his heirs. What a blessing and a privilege that was totally undeserved. As I grew in my faith as a young man and I became understanding of the gospel and what it meant for me, it became very clear to me at a young age that if God had adopted me into his family, then what better way to show others a picture of the gospel than to adopt children and to be part of my family. When I met my wife, Melissa, that was one of the first conversations we had about our future was the role that adoption would play in our life. And God made it very clear that she also had a similar calling in life. It didn't hurt that when I met her, she was the house mother of a group of 21 orphans. So that made it pretty clear that she could probably take care of a couple of kids. And so having adopted kids in our future didn't seem so um, out of the ordinary. So after we had three children, we intentionally stopped having children of our own so that we could leave room in our hearts for other children to be part of our family. So these are just some of my kiddos that are here. And that's my daughter, Gabby. She's the ninth one. And I don't know if Nora's in here. I hope Nora's not in there, but she's, she's my tenth one. And originally, we had adopted our younger five. And then after we finished our adoption in 2017, uh, about four months later, CPS called us and said, hey, they have another little sister that's born. Do you want her too? And that's Gabby. That's one who came to us in 2018. And then a year later, CPS called us again. They said, there's another little girl that's born. Do you want her too? And we said, sure. And that's Nora. And that's how she ended up with a family of 10. Adoption was for God and is for us costly. When the fullness of time had come, this is in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 5. It says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. What does it mean to redeem? To redeem means to obtain or to set free by paying a price. What was the price that God paid for our liberation and adoption? In the previous chapter in Galatians chapter 3, Paul writes this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Our adoption as his sons cost the father his son, cost Jesus his life. It was very costly for the Lord to bring us into his family. And the reality is that adopting children 
is also very costly. You know, some are financial, but some are emotional. There are costs of time and stress for the rest of your life. There's much sacrifice required to take care of your children. You will never stop being a parent until they die. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Adoption is not an easy thing. It's not for the faint of heart. And adoption will require much sacrifice. Adoption meant for all Christians and for now Christian parents that we suffer now and experience glory later. What do I mean by that? You guys have been talking about suffering. As we talked about last night, is this whole life of faith is a life of suffering, right? I didn't adopt my children because I wanted happiness in my life and where there was some missing hole that I needed to fill. I adopted my children because I knew that was what the gospel required us to do, right? Is that because God adopted me into his family, that is the same way that I'm to love those around me, but that doesn't mean that it's easy. In fact, many times, obedience to God means significant hardship. Romans 8, 22 through 33 says this, the whole creation has been groaning now together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who are the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. That strikes us as strange. Aren't we already adopted? So what does Paul mean when he says that we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption? What does that mean? Yes, we're already adopted. When Christ died for us, the price was paid. The legal transaction was done. And when we trust in him, we are legally and permanently in the family. But God's purpose for adoption is not just to leave any of his children in a state of groaning and suffering. He raised Jesus from the dead with a new body, and he promises that part of the adoption will be a new resurrection body with no more disabilities and no more groaning. Therefore, what we wait for is the full experience of our adoption, which is the resurrection of our bodies. That's what it means when he says that it's eagerly waiting for the adoption of the Son, is that there's a time that's going to come when God is going to make all things right. There's also much groaning in the path of adoption on the way to full salvation. But the outcome is glorious. It is worth it all. Because in Romans 8, 18, it says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy compared to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Looking back on these past seven years, adopting children has been one of the greatest ways that the Lord has refined our character. We have cried more and prayed more in these past years than those that I've ever had before. Now, we shared last night about our deportation from India and the suffering and pain we went through, and I remember praying a lot. But over these past seven years, I have prayed far more for my children than I ever did during the time that I was on the mission field. When I look back at our life, we have spent far more time pleading before the Lord on behalf of our children than we ever did during that process of being exiled from India. We have asked the Lord to work on our children's heart to bring about healing and to restore the childhood that was lost. I've had to come home numerous times to a wife that was battered and bruised when one of our children lashed at her violently. I come home, she's weeping because one of the kids got really mad and hit her and I can see all the bruises on her arms. We've had to grow in patience and love as we have learned that loving kids that have been let down over and over again is not easy. I've sat with one of my children in multiple psychiatric hospitals for months wondering if I could keep our family safe and it helped them to understand that we love them even when they act out in violence. The experience of adoption has made me understand just how much the Lord loves me despite all my own failures. Yet in all this, we have to say that the power of Christ to transform the hearts and minds is the real miracle. Our children know that there's a God who deeply loves them and that even in their pain and when they felt so alone, he saw them. We thank the Lord that five of our younger seven children have come to put their faith in Jesus Christ and two have publicly declared that through baptism. Does that make the daily struggles any easier? Not necessarily, but yet we remember the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. We hold on, we cling to that promise that God who began a good work in each of my children will be faithful to complete it. Not always on my time, but in his time, he'll be faithful to complete it. So now I want to make this a little more relevant to you. What is the situation here in Oklahoma? There are 9,000 children currently in Oklahoma foster care. 9,000 children. 500 of those 9,000 children are eligible for adoption from foster care and waiting for a family to say, yes, I'll take this kid in. I'll take this group of siblings in and give them a home, a family that they never had. 
The average child spends two to five years waiting for a home, and 20% of kids wait over five years before they ever get adopted, and 10% of kids age out of the system at age 18, never having found a family to call their own as their home. There are 4,000 churches, a little bit over 4,000 churches in Oklahoma. What if just a few families in each church opened up their home to the orphan? We could clear out the entire foster care system in Oklahoma within a few weeks. Right? But it requires commitment, and it requires being obedient to God's call and realizing that you were adopted, and because of that, you have the ability to be able to bring others into your home and give them a life and a family they never had. That's my challenge to you. You can be part of God's redemptive plan. James 1.27 says this, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. Many of us, most of us, live lives with so much abundance. We have homes with extra bedrooms, extra food, extra clothing. But what you may not realize is that our hearts also have extra room to love others that did not initially belong to us. Before adoption, I only thought I had enough love in my heart for my three biological kids, but through adoption, I've learned there's plenty extra for another seven. In the Indian community, the thought has always been is that families adopt if they can't have children of their own, right? That's what everybody thinks, right? You can't have kids? Well, at that point, you should adopt, right? It's never plan A. It's only considered a possibility the Lord does not bless us with children of our own, but that's not the gospel, right? God the Father already had a son in Jesus, Right? He didn't need to adopt us into his family. Right? He had everything. He had a perfect relationship with his son. But yet, because of his great mercy and his love for us, he said, no, I want to include you in my family, and I want you to make you an heir. Right? There was no need for him to add others to his family, but yet he chose to pursue us and adopt us into his family because of his great love. The reality is that millions of children in America and around the world in India go to bed each night wondering if God sees them or hears their cries. Millions of children want to belong, to be part of a family, to be loved unconditionally. The reality is that if you're willing to take a step in faith, you could be part of changing the life of a child or maybe many children forever. You can change the trajectory of their life to help them know that God saw them in their suffering and pain, to give them a place where they belong and a chance at a life they would have never had. Is it going to be easy? Not at all. It will require greater obedience and faith than probably anything you've ever done till now, but God promises that his grace will be what? Sufficient. One of my older kids had asked me multiple times why we've gone through the pain and heartache of adopting children. They knew what our family looked like before we adopted our younger seven, and they'd seen firsthand the tears we shed and the pain we'd gone through during the past seven years. They were struggling to make sense of how kids that had been given a second chance in life could still sometimes act out in anger and rebellion. I'd asked the Lord that same question many times. Lord, why is it that even though we love all of our children, why do they sometimes reject us and push us away? And in those moments of frustration and despair, the Holy Spirit gently reminded me of the truth. That is exactly how I am with the Lord. Right? Though the Lord loved me extravagantly and gave up his greatest sacrifice of his son for my sake, yet how often do I spurn his love, reject his authority in my own life, and yet God still pursued me? So my answer to my child was the same as what the Holy Spirit is teaching me. It is only the gospel that makes adoption possible. It is the power of the gospel being lived out to show love and mercy even when those we love sometimes push us away. If we as Christians who have received such unmerited favor from the Lord, who has adopted us into his family, don't adopt, who will? Who will have the ability to do that unless they have a supernatural source, a place for them to turn back to and say, Lord, you have to carry us through this. The call to adoption is an impossible task, but yet God promised us that he would give us his Holy Spirit to help us do what is impossible on our own, to continue pursuing, to continue loving. So that's my challenge to you, my friends. Think about the blessings you've been given by the Lord. God didn't bless you just for yourself. He blessed you so that you could be a blessing to others. Don't forget the orphan in our midst. Through adoption, there's an opportunity for you to rewrite the story of someone's life and point them to Jesus, who first adopted us as children into his family. Can you turn up the sound? I want to show you a quick video, and we'll end.
Is the sound off? Yes, thank you. Technical difficulties. That's okay. This is a quick video that shows this young boy who's an African-American boy coming into this family. And in that picture, there's a picture of the family with their parents and the two kids. And he walks in as a foster child, right? He gets in the family, he becomes part of that family, and then finally comes up and he looks at that wall. And in that wall, there's a picture now, not only of his two parents, but now he's included in that picture because now he's part of that family, right? That's the same message, right? All of us have the opportunity to be able to extend a home, a, a, a place where children can come in and be part of a family because that's the same way that God loved us. Let me pray. Holy Father, we just thank you so much for the message of the gospel. Lord, we thank you that we're adopted as sons into your family to be heirs with you. Lord, I pray that, Lord, you would bring conviction. Lord, you've blessed us with so much. You've given us so many resources. And I pray that we would look among those around us, Lord, that need a home, need a family to say yes to them, to be able to say that they're valuable in your sight, that they're worth something. And I pray, Lord, that you bring conviction, and, Lord, that many would follow that calling, and, Lord, that so that, um, Lord, the name of Jesus would be glorified. And pray this in Christ's name. Amen.